Good evening, everyone. It's freakishly quiet in here, so I guess we better, <laughs> we better start the show. Uh, my name is Andrew James Clark, and um, you're at a sh show called Classical Context. I want to name it Context. That's a housing firm, so I'd add co uh, Classical in front of it. It's kind of geeky, but you, you, you catch the drift. We are, if you haven't heard of us before, we're actually six years old. We've been functioning in the GTA for a while. Um, mainly playing in churches and to non-classical music listeners in churches. For ex it's, it's and only this past year we've been duplicating our shows here at the CMC. Um, uh, you, can have, you can already tell there's, there's a difference between cultures, because when, when church people come in, I'm going to talk a lot about church people tonight, because it's Ives. <laughs> when church people come in, they just sit down. You guys have all generously, well, some of you have <laughs> generously uh, put the money in the donation box already. Thank you so much. There was a little envelope. S s there was a little envelope in the thing to put it in during intermission because, you know, if you don't like the show, you, have, you don't have to donate. So <laughs> it was like a friendly gesture. If you hate me, you can leave without paying. But you've all been generous up front. So that's nice. That's, that makes me feel good inside. Um, tonight's, <laughs> tonight's music is uh, Ives and Bartox. You can tell with the fiddlers on the roof are um, going on up there. Is there anything else you need to know? We have another show here in May with Michael Bridge, who's a fantastic accordion player. This is actually, this is, tonight's our second show of the season. So first we had Rashawn Allwood with Messian. Tonight we have Ives and Bartox. And in, um, in May we have Michael Bridge. He's releasing a new album. I can't remember if he's released it or he's going to release it. But anyways, I'm sure it will be spectacular. He has an electronic synthesized accordion. He does things that are amazing. He's, he's, most of you probably know him. If, if you've ever been on Facebook, his face is plastered all over the place. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, so that's us. Thank you all for coming. I'm astounded you're here. <laughs> Good. Okay. So without further ado, I am going to start the show and welcome our concert lecturer on the stage. He is going to lecture for approximately 15 to 17 minutes. Then we will start the music. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew James Clark, and thank you all for coming. Ives was a manly man man. Where are we here? An American manly man man. So you, you back up, back up. There we go. Ives was a manly man man. Yes, Bartok was not. But Ives was. Ives' father was, a so, uh, was the, the band master, the band master the best bandmaster in the um, Union Army during the Civil War. Um, the, the regiment was so specialized, actually, they actually got a special shout out from President Lincoln. Um, I can't, I don't know what they did, but it must have been something astounding because they were a highly recognized group of people. Anyways, this crazy bandmaster gave birth to Charles Ives and, you know, grit. This is Danbury, Connecticut in the late 1800s. So it's a very backwater, um, you know, country hicks <laughs> is what we Torontonians would call them, right? Not a professional musician in sight. Now, like any good father, <sighs> Charles Ives' father wanted to live vicariously through his son. He wanted to be a composer but didn't quite make it. So he thrust all of this war, chaotic band music into his son's head. He would make them... Um, he would, he would make him, s he would, what would he do? He would play the piano in a different key than make Ives sing in a, different, in a different key as opposed to the piano to challenge him and stuff like that. Ives thought it was fun. He retained it for the rest of his life. But yes, very gritty, very, uh, you know, country stuff. So Ives grew up with this crazy father making him play all his music in the wrong keys at the same time. Uh, he was surrounded by, you know, no professional musicians. So the only music he would have ever heard would have been amateur church choirs, barnyard, fiddle music, and such, and pretty much like cowbells, pretty much everything you could imagine that would be out of tune, right? The times were a lot different back then, although I, it's arguable. Back then you could, not be <laughs> you could not be taken seriously as a musician if you did not have European training. So if you wanted to be taken seriously as a musician, if you wanted to become a classical musician, you had to... If you were in North America, you had to leave. It was like a mandatory thing. You would not be... I should probably move this. 
you would not be taken seriously uh, if you did not go to Europe. Okay. Of course, also at the same time, America didn't have any nationalistic music. You could say there's, you know, there's South American, hy there's South American, there's the African slave trade hymns and stuff like that, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't be accepted in the North as nationalistic American music, right? So there's no, there's, there's no, you know, oh, they're kind of like us, no culture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're a young country, no culture, no music to rely on. So I have just stuck in this backwater country with this crazy father who's forcing music onto him playing music in the wrong key, uh, he decides he wants to be a musician or his father decided for him and he knows he needs to get proper training. The nearest place he could go was Yale, which was full of people who had been, which is full of largely Americans who had gone to Europe and come back. Ives' teacher at Yale was named Horatio Parker and Ives brought all of his, well by this time Ives was composing and he was doing exactly what his father told him. He would do marching band stuff, he would do things in the wrong key, polyrhythms, polytonal stuff. He took it to Horatio Parker and Horatio Parker told him never to write it ever again. And he spent the four years learning to write strict fugues in European music. He didn't like it. His father also, I, I believe his father passed away the first year he was in Yale or right around that time. So he's born in all this chaotic dust, <laughs> American dust, primitive dust. And he goes to Yale and he's told, you can't do that anymore. You have to compose like a Germanic real composer. So he tries to do that for a few years. He's unhappy. So by the time he graduates Yale, he realizes he has a decision to make. He can either, there's, there's two possibilities. Either he can simplify his music and write the music he doesn't want to write and make money. Or he can write the music he wants to write and not make money and starve to death. He figured he wanted a wife and kids. So he came up with a solution. He started an insurance company in New York and became a millionaire and pulled a Bach and composed in the evenings and, and, and uh, weekends. As Bach did in Leipzig when he was there. He was, was this, Bach was a school teacher. He's composing during the evenings. That's what Ives did. Um, so for example, the violin sonatas you heard tonight may have been composed on a train ride home from New York, away from a piano and all sane musicians. He has all this music uh, that phases in and out of American stuff. First of all, Horatio Parker, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Horatio Parker didn't like his music. It was called Bizarre. He had the American stuff in it. Let's talk about what Ives music did and why it irritated Horatio Parker. Have you guys ever been to the Santa Claus parade? Right, I, I did, right? You know, there's that, I don't know if you've ever noticed, there's that moment when you're in between two marching bands and you can hear both at the same time. So I was, I remember being a kid and thinking, that's really agitating. Why can't they spread them out throughout the Santa Claus parade so I don't have to get stuck in the middle and for, be confused for five seconds? That's just me. Ives actually liked it. And so does his father, obviously, coming from the Civil War. So Ives would try to capture this, these dualities, two things happening at the same time, and he would put it into his music. Of course, he would also use American folk tunes and stuff. So the music he was taking to Horatio Parker was basically just, like, you can imagine it as three or four songs stacked on top of each other played at the same time, right? I was once in a car, when I was first learning to drive my parents, would both tell me different directions at the same time, and my head almost exploded. It's the only time I've sworn at my parents. And I didn't mean to, it just the information overwhelmed my brain and my head exploded, right? So human beings can actually only listen to, they can only retain that much information. Ives pushes and pushes and pushes and layers and layers and layers these opposing sound worlds on top of each other because he wants you to capture that. He wants you to be reminded of the Santa Claus parade and in between those two marching bands. So that's him. 90% of his music did not get played and then he died. And that's that. Mm -hmm. He was an insurance salesman. In fact, uh, his insurance company was the biggest in the country. It was life insurance. It was the biggest in the country for a while. So he was really was a millionaire and did not die uncomfortable, uncomfortably. There were some champions of his music such as Aaron Copeland, Henry Cowell, 
Lou Harrison, who would try to take his music forward. The problem is Ives constantly hits a barrier. There's a reason you don't see Ives performed often. Ives' third, Ives' fourth symphony, for example, has three conductors, a choir, a microtonal piano, two other pianos, and an organ. And the, and the orchestra is spread out through the, yeah, through the hall. You can imagine, that would irritate the TSO. It's next to impossible to play. <laughs> Okay, his music is deathly impossible. There, when Alice and I were rehearsing this music, there was a few times we just looked at each other like, we don't know what's wrong. It's, it's absolutely ballistic. It doesn't fit the hands. If you play the piano, Bach, you know, pianists are expected to play, are expected to play like four melodies at the same time in two hands, right? That means you can only, you can write, the composer has to write them within a specific span of the piano. Ives writes them like this, right? So sometimes I'm just playing, Melody is like this for, yeah, it's, n it's not fun. <laughs> I've been practicing since July, and it should not have taken that long. It should, that's unreasonable. In fact, the last few weeks, I'm thinking, this passage still stinks, and I've been practicing it how many months? No wonder nobody plays these. They are ballistic. In fact, they, they just run on willpower. All of his pieces are like this. Performers don't like them. They're not idiomatically written. Idiomatically means if you write something like, if you write for an instrument, it has to suit the instrument. Every piece of music cannot be transplanted onto every other piece of music, except Bach sometimes. But, but you know, we try, to, we try to feature the instruments these days. Ives didn't do it, and he made it, yeah. It's just the limits of the instruments are pushed. It's an, it's, it's an absolute nightmare. It's an absolute, it's, it's a nightmare. <laughs> As a side note, if there are any contemporary performers in the audience, I think you are not a contemporary performer until you've played Ives, because it's like playing the worst student composer piece you could possibly imagine. <laughs> and you have to make decisions. You have, sometimes things are impossible. You're like, this can't be played. So you have to choose which part you play. I don't know if you guys have read the writings by Bach's son, CPE Bach. He has an essay on leaving out <laughs> notes when you can't play. Work hard up until the performance, but if you still can't get it, start leading, leaving out notes. I'm not leaving out any notes tonight, but uh, yeah. I'm not. I'm just, I'm just smudging them. And it's out of tune writing, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so that being said, if nobody likes him... Oh, the other, the other problem is, I don't know what the dates of these sonatas are because he was constantly kind of lying. Because he wrote all these things and no one would play them, he would edit them decades later. And, well, as, the, as we became more dissonant in music, he might have written these sonatas, very constant, very pretty, and heard on the radio, huh, Schoenberg's writing dissonant music. I better go add more dissonance. And I, they're like that. But he would keep the original date of his composition. So m even music historians are irritated by this man because they can't track when they can't. He, he's, he's, you know, people think he's a progressive and he, was, he foreshadowed all this stuff. It's impossible to tell because he might have written a piece, I don't know, around World War I. And then 20 years later, he heard another composer do some crazy polyrhythm, then he would put it in his piece and say, well, I wrote that. That's the guy we're dealing with. So why would I, why would I play that man's music? Right? Okay. I am a church musician, and I'm not European. I'm not quite a country hick, but I'm from Ajax. So that's like, I guess the same thing. I feel like it. Anyways, I've been a church musician my entire life, and I wasn't surrounded by professional musicians for an extremely long time. Um, and I've never, well, I identify with this music. <laughs> it's written by a weasel. Who would have who thought I identify with that music? Anyways, there's, there's a lot of hidden messages in this music about church people. I'm going to make fun of church people. I'm a Christian, so I can make fun of church people and not offend anybody. I forgot, to, the artistic director forgot to mention that there will be no charitable receipts given because we are not a charitable organization. We are a business. Why are we a business? So I can say whatever I want without the government being mad and taking away my funding. Yes, thank you. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak as a Christian, making fun of Christians for, for, for 30 seconds. So sometimes what, you know, so it's a, I work in a Baptist church, so it's, you know, I'm not Catholic. You know, they're praying, you got to play something pretty. So they're transcending, their prayers are being answered. You know, something mystical. Everybody, 
with all the television stuff, everybody's used to like. Sometimes when people are praying, I actually provide background music because it might be a volunteer person, so they're nervous, right? So it, if it was dead silent in the room, like it was when I walked in, they might get really nervous. But if I create a, a musical pad, it, it makes them feel more comfortable. But then something happens. Some, sometimes I'll be playing and I'll think, wow, I've set the atmosphere perfectly. It's incredible. I'm a genius. Then someone will say, Naaman! I was like, okay, that's fine. Reset the atmosphere. Key modulate a little bit, new key. Hallelujah! It's like, oh, okay. Okay. There's like a chain reaction, right? Once one person does it, now they're all yelling hallelujah. <laughs> so I have to move registers. The person's praying. People are yelling. What is the pianist supposed to do? The pianist has to reset a bunch of things. It's very disturbing. Plus, I actually have, like, I'm improvising. I have to be in the mood. I'm trying to get with Jesus, too, and people are screaming. So what do I have to do, right? It's very traumatizing, because I'm listening and then yelling, and then back to listening and yelling. Kind of like Ives in a marching band, right? If you're in America and then, I don't know, there's a marching band running around and things are going off, or a community choir, or a community orchestra, and things just aren't right. You have these unexpected bursts of chaos running through your music, even though you're trying to do things properly. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's very aggravating. Ives wrote these jokes into his music. So for example, in the fourth sonata of the middle movement, it's a prayer on... On Jesus, there's a hymn, uh, Jesus Loves Me. He was irritated. In, in fact, he made fun of the denominations, which I won't do today, but he actually said different denominations have different calls, and some are more irritating than others, which I won't say which ones he said today. But he wrote this entire piece. The, the opening is a prayer. And then right in the middle, everybody starts screaming hallelujah. So you're going to hear Alice play this beautiful, unearthly melody. Then all of a sudden, I'm going to do the ugliest thing you've ever heard. And it just goes on, and that's the middle section. Just the screaming, and then layer by layer, the third section, I remove a layer, and I remove a layer, and I remove a layer until it's just the congregation praying again. That's really interesting. And on top of that, see, Ives, Ives was an intelligent person. By the time you get to the, even though it irritates the pianist, he knows the congregation is doing its thing. So by the time you get to the third movement, it's actually more mystical and, you know, spiritual than it would have been if the yelling hadn't occurred. So that's really interesting. There's other things, too, that irritate church pianists. I have to, I have to give this show in a church tomorrow night. I wonder how that's going to go. <laughs> you're going to throw me out. Church musicians can hear you. <laughs> Church musicians can hear the congregation singing, right? So the church musicians are providing a beat. It, it's just, there's always one person, just always one, who's really late and off key. <laughs> and it just never goes away. It's, it's, it's just... So what does Ives do? He writes into his music. So there's a hymn you might recognize, I, uh, Come Thou Fount of Many Blessings. This is the third movement of the second sonata. Right, so the, the third movement of the second sonata is one gigantic joke. It starts out, you're going to hear, well, you're going to hear this. I'm playing an E major. I'm playing that tune in E major. And Alice is going to be playing the same tune late in B flat major, which is a completely different key. Right, you hear that? There's a late person, here's me. And then play it at the same time. And this is actually my favorite movement. For the entire movement, what's going to happen is the, the old lady is going to catch up slowly and slowly to the rest of the congregation. 
until it's really, really tense and they're really, really close. And then the final joke is when she gets it, the song is over. <laughs> the life I live, I identify with this music. But it's really good. I don't know, I actually don't know many people here tonight. I don't know what your musical backgrounds are. But if you know Steve Reich, he came up, he was this really s smart, he came up with this thing called phasing, right? Which is, well, you take two tapes. I don't know if you've ever been in Best Buy and they play two movies at the same time in TVs beside each other, but they're at sa the different rates. So you don't know where to look. If you take a tape and separate it just a tiny bit and wiggle it back together, it creates a really cool effect. See, Ives couldn't have really stolen that from Steve Reich. That would have been impossible. That's not the right timeline. So I see this piece as like a super cool foreshadowing of electronic music, what we do. There's the same thing in an opposing key, and it moves slowly, 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 slowly back together. Who would have thought the old lady was foreshadowing Steve Reich's electronic phase? Yeah. But that's that. Do I have anything else to say? I know you're probably thinking, be quiet and play some music now. Oh, yeah, last thing. OK. so. The coolest sensation about these sonatas is the fact that for 90% of the time, Alice and I are going to sound like we're not playing the same piece. And you'll think, wow, they really did not practice. And then there's this magical moment where we smash together and all of a sudden you're going to hear this beautiful church hymn in unison. Ives got this, this way of writing and this philosophy kind of from his father. And if you, if you know his fourth symphony, uh, this was basically Ives' form. So every one of these strands kind of represents our own lives, right? So we all start at birth in the same place, but in the middle is chaos, and we're all smashing into each other, going, it's like a roller coaster of, of nonsense. But he believed music, and church hymns in particular, kind of transcended that life's chaos, and all kind of wiggled us back in to death at the end, and we all end up at, back at the same place. So it's, you can, I mean, to me that looks like a Bach fugue, but... <laughs> Doesn't it? It's like sonata form. It's everything. <laughs> but anyways, birth. we start off at the same place, or sometimes not. Sometimes I will drop us right into the chaos. But every one of these pieces has a coming together right at the end where Alice and I squish together our music, and all of a sudden everything makes sense in retrospect. So that's what you're going to be hearing. Are you ready? I gave you a long warning because it's bizarre music. Not as bizarre as the Messienne that Rashawn played, but... But it's, it's pretty out there. Oh, and um, see, I designed this concert. E yeah, no, I won't say that. For, the, for, any <laughs> for the non-churchgoers in the audience, I've included a stock footage clip of industrial workers back from Ives' time. And you're going to hear the first little opening of the church hymn, and you have to retain it. Right, for the if, if you go to church and you know these church hymns, you're going to enjoy the ride because it's going to be like death, 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 boom, church hymn. But for, <laughs> for those of you who are, you, you don't know what the theme is, I actually, I'm breaking eyes rules and I'm going to reveal to you in a tiny clip 30 seconds before the piece what the hymn is. You've got to remember it because it's going to come back at the end and in retrospect, the movements we will be playing will make sense. Yes. Can you please welcome Alice Hong to the stage? <laughs> <laughs>